Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Welcome to Studio Sunday. I hope everyone's staying warm. I made you a Valentine card. <laughs> hey, we're expecting sleet and snow in Houston. Sleet and yeah. snow in Houston. You don't hear those words together very often. <laughs> we are 40 miles from the Gulf Coast waterline. I it's mean, nutty. This anyway. is like the Gulf Coast freezing. We were just talking about how everybody here, when it freezes like this, and it's going to get down to 12. This is unheard of in Houston. But anytime it freezes, which is not very often, people cover their plants because it's all tropical. Mm -hmm. And we, we let everybody looks like they're having a garage sale. <laughs> the people across the street have um, tarps covering their plants, but to hold the tarp down, they've got all their kids' toys. Right. All the bicycles and and... Uh, yeah. Big outside toys. It's funny. It does look like yard sale. <laughs> so. They use the same big tarps that you see on the roofs when the hurricanes blow the roofs off. So those tarps are in the yard covering it. I mean, hey, well, you got to do what you got to do, babe. And they and they put poor you know Ert and Bernie out there in the yard to hold them down. Ert and Bernie. I've always called them that. <laughs> so uh, we don't get freeze very often. So everybody. You know, everything's tropical. We have yeah. ginger and ferns and everything in our yard, and they're going to just get, they're going to be frozen. This is literally where the delicate flowers come from. <laughs> so, anyway, it's, it's quite uh, quite yeah. exciting for us here. Unfortunately, it's not good excitement. No. But anyway, so we're in for the week. We love it's the drama. Be, it's supposed to be bad all week. Mm. So, so we're just staying in for the week, which sadly is not much different than what we've been doing for the past year. <laughs> And, like South Park, we blame Canada. <laughs> okay, so this week, How to Draw went to the printer, and it should be available in stores and on our site on March 24th. So keep an eye out for it, or order it from your comic book shop. Yeah. The people that ordered the hardcover will get theirs um, about the same time, I think. It should all happen about the same time. Good. Uh, Serial 2 will be in stores next Wednesday, the 24th of February. And Terry's working hard on Serial 3. Zoe's been very busy. Right there. Yes, she has. She's she's very industrious. She's so, a go-getter. So this, get caught up now before he gets too too much further into it. She's a go-getter and she has somebody to go get now. So. Uh, also, you're working on sketches for Terry Moore Live, right? I am. Uh, and are you sure you're not going to do a dance number for us? Yeah, I'm really sure. Oh, come on. What I really want to do is sing. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind, April 9th and 10th. No dancing. You're going to dance, I'll sing. <laughs> sing. And finally, I took a hard count. Oh, I, I even hate to talk about this, but we're going to talk about it. I took a hard count of the extra Rachel Rising Black hard covers that we found in the warehouse move. And we have 36 copies. 36. 36, not a lot, but 36. And these are not numbered, there's no book plate. These were overages that the printer, uh, we have to take their overages if it's 5% or less. So that's what these were. Okay. Um, There'll be 36 copies. We're gonna put them up on our website on February 19th, which is Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time. Okay. Uh, this coming Friday. This coming Friday, 36 copies. That's it, 36 copies. Yeah, there are, there'll be $100 each, and we're limiting the sale to one book per customer. Not one book per order, but one book per customer. So you can't go back and re or, you know place another order after you make your first order. Because we really want people to, people really want this book and we want to be fair about it. So. Uh, this book is, you know, crazy uh, aftermarket. And that's not what this is about. This is about, uh, there are so many people that really truly want that yeah. copy of that book because they're, they love the story. Uh, they're collecting only omnibuses. And it's a cool looking book. It's a cool looking book. It's yeah. black on black, you know, like an ACDC thing or something. But um, I hope that the readers, all, all 36 readers, get this. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So, February 9th, Friday, February 19th at 10 a.m. Central Time. It'll go live on our website. So. Okay. 11 a.m. It's a, it's a bittersweet 
thing for me because I know more people than that want it, mm -hmm. but that's all we have. And so I'd rather go ahead and get, get those out to 36 people rather than have them sit in the warehouse. But I know there are more people that really want it. It's hard for me. I picture... <laughs> I want to be fair. I know. I picture it being one of those things where people are waiting for that, for the clock to tick. Um, so be ready. Get your finger ready. Okay, so do you have anything else to add, Mr. Moore? Um, no. I'm just crazy about everything you talked about. You know, the books and the weather. So we're <laughs> sharing the same news. <laughs> okay. Hey, you had waffles and, and bacon for breakfast. I did. My Valentine made me breakfast. It was so good. It's not easy when he's gluten-free, guys. No. Okay, um, so you ready to get on the hot seat? Yeah. Let's I think it. it's a good place to be today. <laughs> I don't know. I'll take it. I'll put on my seat warmer. So, yeah. Okay, this question is from Travis Steinwing. I hope I said that right. And this is a question we've never discussed, which is great. What was Terry's inspiration for the Molly and Pooh story that ended up in SIP 49? Uh, the inspiration was a combination of uh, Jack the Ripper and Lizzie Borden. So when I was going through a phase where I was reading about all the old scandals, the Victorian scandals, um, it filled my head with all this stuff. And I was thinking about what if you took uh, those stories, the Jack the Ripper setting, the Lizzie Borden um, weird tension, and then you mashed it up with all the romantic poets of that time, you know, the music and everything, the pretty things that were happening at the time. And I, I came up with this, you know, demented love story between this Victorian woman who is married and stifled. And then there's this, uh, what did they call women back in that time that were very independent and breaking all the rules? Hussies? <laughs> no, hussies were in the 30s and 40s. I don't know. So then you've got this uh, wild uh, lady who comes into her life and uh, makes things very interesting. And there's a cool twist in the story at the very end. Um, who is fooling who? So uh, I just thought it was, I was fascinated by the suffocation of Victorian times. Of course, the more I read about it, the more uh, I realized it wasn't as suffocating as we think. <laughs> and Queen Victoria herself was really actually um, quite the romantic until her husband passed. So yeah, it was, it was interesting to dive into those times and think about it. And you originally published those in the front of Strangers in Paradise issues, didn't you? It did start. I, in Strangers in Paradise, I was, you know, you could open up a book and find four different creative idea of things going on in there, a cartoon, a poem, maybe some prose. And then one of them was this little uh, letter section where Molly and Pooh were exchanging letters. And that began to grow uh, from the letters. It, it became a short story chapter and then all that. So the story And then you grew. combined that and put it in a single issue. I finally had enough to make a single issue. Yeah. And then later on down the road, I finished the single issue story out into three issues and it became a, a trade paperback all on its own. Yeah. So. And that was during the Strangers in Paradise mm -hmm. run. All during that, yeah. It really grew very organically. It started off as, you know, one, one Lord Byron letter with a demented twist and then it just kind of grew from there, so. Which is probably the same reason why I'm still fascinated by the uh, uh, even earlier Mary Shelley era and where these kind of monsters come from in the middle of, I'm pointing at my Frankenstein, I'm going to show you. Um, where did this stuff come from in the 19th century? That's so amazing, you know, early 19th century for this guy. So, pretty amazing. The imagination back then. Okay. Well, Travis, thank you for your question. Thanks, Travis. Um... You guys send me some questions at mail at abstractstudiocomics.com so that we can keep Terry on his toes and in the hot seat. Yeah, because I need it because it's cold. So that's it for me. What are you drawing today? Well, um, I went through uh, hell and high water to draw this Frankenstein's. And I'm going to explain to you how I started it, how I messed it up and got way off track, 
and then how I just wouldn't let it go and I got it back on track, which is something that happens to a lot of drawings that we, we try, you know. Your, ske your rough sketch looks good, your finished sketch, you got all the details right, but it doesn't look anything like what you wanted. <laughs> and then you go back in and get brave and then you just do whatever it takes and boom, you can nail it, so. Okay, we'll yeah. meet, uh, you'll be right back here. Meet me right here and I'll show you what I did. You guys have a great week. Okay, so normally um, this is my typical sketch and we drew this a couple of weeks ago on the on my YouTube program, <laughs> whatever I call it. Uh, so this is what I spent a lot of time focusing on how to draw. But let me show you something. If we dip that back into my first childhood sketchbook, um, when I was practice, still practicing my signature, um, I lived in uh, Africa when I was 10 years old. You, you know that probably, uh, in Dar es Salaam. And one of the things I got for my birthday was this uh, sketchbook where I was, you know, I drew all my favorite superheroes. But one of the things I also drew was Frankenstein. And I just kind of drew it off the top of my head and tried to, you know, the same with the mummy. And I think that that's actually, whoops, I bumped the thing, sorry. I think that's actually Sue Richards, because uh, I was reading a lot of Fantastic Four back then. Um, anyway, Frankenstein. And I thought, I haven't drawn him since. And I watched uh, Son of Frankenstein recently and really enjoyed the movie again. And I thought, you know, I need to try it again. So, um... I put aside my usual, you know, comic book work. Uh, this is serial from Serial 3. And I dove into drawing Frankenstein again. Now this is the sketch that I decided I'm finished. But um, I'm not showing this to you to uh, say, hey, look what I did. I'm showing this to you because this was a hell of a journey. <laughs> You would not believe where I started and where I got to the middle of it and I thought, I'm done. And then I thought, no, I'm not. That doesn't look anything like him. So I want to talk through the process of making a sketch that you want to turn out well. And then halfway through it, you think you're done and you realize, no, I really did not nail it at all. Uh, I need to get back in there and rework it, which is the beauty of pencil, of course. So. I laid the sketch out with my uh, faithful uh, Faber-Castell uh, .05 and I just laid out the rough sketch and kind of got in the placements where the features are. Um, and I, I think I have a photo of that that I can show you here on the screen because I was posting it as a work in progress. Um, and then at that point as a work in progress, it still had, um, it was still kind of on track. You could tell that I would... I can get there if I did the right things. So I knuckled down and I began poly I began looking at just that and just that and just that. And I began just polishing and doing all my little stuff. And at this point, I'm using a black wing because it's dark, you know. So I have this one and even the darker one. So I've got my little black wing and I'm working on the details. Do, 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 do. And then I go through the trouble to make the background. There's two electrical scopes and there were really obvious in the film. And then these uh, spinning plates that um, I don't know what they're supposed to do in an electrical plant, but there they were. Um, and I don't have an elliptical uh, template big enough for that. So I freehanded it and it looks just like I'm 10 years old again, trying to draw a circle, but it works. Um, so, when I get finished with all these little details and I've highly rendered it, I pull it back and I, who do I have? Do I have Frankenstein? No, I have Herman Munster. <laughs> I drew a guy with a big, beautiful jaw and a you know, shorter nose and uh, the eyes were more open. And at one point I even had little high, lighting highlights in the eyes, which made the eyes look like they had come to life. And if you'll notice, on the real thing, there is no highlights in the eyes because when you're dead, there is no moisture on your eyeball and the eye, eyeball collects dust and the dust filters away on those unfo unfocused pupils. It filters away the light and gives you kind of a glazed look, uh, kind of a flat glaze. 
So these eyes are, uh, there's no reflection in those eyes on purpose. Even the 1940s makeup men and uh, lighting director knew better than to get any highlights in those eyes. I did not, even though I should know better. Um, so I I showed my Herman Munster drawing to Robin and she said, that doesn't look scary. And I thought, you know why? Because it doesn't look like him at all. And I held my Herman Munster drawing up next to the photo of, uh, photo, <laughs> I'm in the theater. <laughs> up next to the photo of uh, my Frankenstein that I was using as reference. And they looked nothing alike, you know. I, my Frankenstein looked handsome. Uh, so, I really got back in there with the erasers. So I pulled out this eraser and um, the little spot eraser, this guy. Um, and I cleaned all this stuff back up. And instead of trying to use my instincts to draw what I thought was appropriate, I really looked at the photograph and really went ahead and went with what I thought was, at first I thought it was clumsy, makeup that he had a bulge up at the top here where his real uh, Boris Karloff skull went back up into a skull cap uh, that was squared off at the top. But then I realized that's probably exactly where the stitches were for Dr. Frankenstein. And that's why they have the uh, really gross uh, staples up here that that is Dr. Frankenstein's skull cap, not the makeup guy. I mean, they were good enough to know not to just, you know, have a bunch of paper mache up there. Um, so that's on purpose. So I went with it and stopped trying to, to fix it because it is so important. And then there's this broad white plane. And then there uh, is the shadowing is so important on these eyes. These half-lidded eyes were so important and I was trying to make them more organic in my Herman Munster drawing. Um, and I found it weird that this eye had such a severe, both of them have severe slopes where they put these heavy lids on him, but this one really slopes. And uh, I had tried to make them more balanced before. It did not work. You have to do the slope because it makes him look like um, he is barely able to stand. And that was kind of the point. Um, there's a uh, electrical fire burning, scarring on the cheek right here that when I first did it, Robin said, that just looks like most squiggly lines, which is what exactly what I did. You know, I did my little um, circle thing that I usually do. So this time I went back in and I stippled it like that point, you know, with the point of the pencil, stippled it, uh, which is time consuming and what it deserves. Um, there was another super, the two sick, uh, tricky points are from here down. Uh, the top lip is so important. I You notice that this side is so much lower than this side. And there is uh, the top lip curls in like that. So that there's kind of a um, more of an, of I don't want to say ape, but it's a little bit more of a heavy top lip that you would find more in, in an original man, first man, as opposed to any... Uh, later evolved civilized man. So they really used this to their advantage. In normal life, this is um, Eddie Van Halen, but under heavy makeup with Boris Karloff, um, it, they really reinforced it. And Boris pulled his lip down on this side and kept this one normal. And uh, it had so much to do with the sneer. There's an implied sneer here that um, you cannot get if you try to fix this mouth. If you try to balance the corners or get this one to come down to, it just doesn't work. It had to be one side only. This side is normal. And then they really played up the lighting on this. And Boris, I maybe he had uh, fake teeth, a couple of teeth over here that he took out, you know, like uh, dentures because it allowed for a real heavy um, indent in the skin right here that is in his face. And I don't really see it in his other uh, normal photos. So maybe he had partial dentures or something that he could take out and then just kind of suck that in, I don't know. 
I don't know the story of, of his makeup, but that's the effect. I mean, there's like, it's as if at some point in his childhood, uh, a, a, a nail got through his cheek and left a permanent scar, indentation scar. That's what it looks like on Frankenstein. And then this side uh, is the sneer. So this is disdain, and here is the sneer. And you need them both with the half-lidded eyes to get this, um, you know, like, um, your life means nothing to me look. Um, and on this side, you can see more of Boris Karloff's normal face like we would see in any of his other movies. So how he did that, I don't know. That's so cool. So the other side is this chin. It has, you know, the... Uh, submissive lower lip the lower lip goes up into so the top lip looks like it has the the, the dominating um profile if you drew this in profile the top lip would come out the bottom lip would go up into the top lip not jut out so um it's it's not uh, a tmj situation it's the opposite where the jaw has come in underneath the top lip but the jaw is still very strong and you get this so he Boris had this really strong, long jaw, but that lip right there going up into it, I don't know, for some reason, it just really adds to the Frankenstein mystique. If he had had a very strong bottom lip, like say, say uh, George Clooney or uh, Michael Keaton, and then plus the Batman jaw, uh, it would have been a Batman. I mean, it would be totally different. But you can look at it right here and see, that's not Batman. That guy is something, this guy is more... Uh, complicated than Batman. Batman has just got the strong uh, football star. He's got the J.G. Watt jaw and, and um, heroic mouth. This is not that. So that was my mistake when I drew Herman Munster. I drew a normal mouth and the J.J. Watt uh, Batman jaw, and I ended up not getting this guy. So every one of these little features all came together and they all worked. And if I got one wrong, the picture just did not, it wasn't Frankenstein. And it's so, I learned that it's so hard to draw somebody that we all know so well, because even if you haven't spent uh, three hours thinking about this and this, like an artist, uh, you know it on sight if it's not right. Um, you know if it looks like Frankenstein or not. Uh, whether you study the details or not, because the overall thing makes an impression. I just want to tell you about uh, sticking with your drawing. Um, if, if you don't like it, keep working on it. And um, work by keeping and continuing to work on it, you begin to find not just what's wrong with the drawing, but what's wrong with your eye, that your eye fixes things that don't need to be fixed sometimes when you're trying to draw something that's very well known. Um, and shortcuts can ruin it, things like that. So you have to take the time to do things. This is still a very sloppy sketch. Uh, if you look on Instagram, there are so many uh, pencil artists who do polished pencils that look just like photographs. So this is still a rough cartoonist sketch. Um, but all I wanted to do was capture the guy. And um, for me today, it works. Uh, and I'm glad I pursued it. So you guys have fun drawing. And um, I'll see you next week.